Welcome to the Fuck the Stigma podcast. Today I have Tamara here with me to kind of speak on mental health, therapy, generational shit. Um, all of that. Yes. <laughs> so how are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing all right. Good. I'm doing all right today. So, yes. So what do you do for a living? Wow. Um, for the past few years, I have been a marriage and family therapist, but right now I'm working in a dual diagnosis um, program and working with substance abuse and other mental health disorders. What is What do you mean dual diagnosis? So dual diagnosis is when you have two diagnoses. So with substance abuse, it's usually never just substance abuse. Mm -hmm. It's usually combined with either anxiety or depression, lots of times trauma, so lots of PTSD, mm. but also it can be other mental health disorders, bipolar, schizophrenia, everything. So you'd be qualified, You're so you're like you're gonna be qualified to work with like both? Yes. That's awesome. Yes, because the, most times with substance abuse, there is another diagnosis on top of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's how, that's how I met you. I, <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't say that. That would be unethical oh, yeah. of so me. What are, like, the, <laughs> what are like the fucking like therapist rules? Right. So um, technically, if I saw you on the street, yeah. I would not be able to say hi to you. You really? have to come up to me. And as long as you come to me, then I can say hello. But I could never say, oh, my gosh, she was a client. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Lots of ethical, legal things behind all of that. So, yeah. But if it's up to the person. So you said it first. Yeah, I was. I was. <laughs> OK, <laughs> I was curious because um, I asked I, I went to Chipotle yesterday mm -hmm. and I saw a therapist okay. that I knew. I was like, oh, my God. Hi. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah it was fun yes. it was a good experience yes um but yeah so i kind of wanted to i kind of wanted to like kind of dig into like a therapist's brain because your your job is to all day talk to people mm -hmm. help them process things mm -hmm. I, and i want to know like what the effect is on you like because you're taking on all this stuff yes. and if like you're an empath mm -hmm. um and have sympathy mm -hmm. for somebody it's like how do you Especially if it's a really hard topic. Wow. I, I think that's been my entire life, you know, really? just as being the firstborn of, of four children, um, the oldest sister, I took on a lot from my siblings. And then before becoming a therapist, I was a school teacher for 20 years. What, so what made you want to become a therapist? Oh, gosh, so much. So I became a therapist because in teaching, you, it's difficult to teach a child how to, and I taught elementary school mm -hmm. and I would get so many kids who were below grade level and things like that. And there are so many other things that come into play when trying to instruct and teach a child to read and to write and to do math when a lot of other things are going on at home mm -hmm. or with them emotionally. And I found myself during the parent teacher conferences sometimes those poor parents would come in and we would spend the majority of the conference not even talking about their child's academics, but maybe some things that are going on at home oh, yeah. and um, drug addiction and death. I had one parent, one grandparent who had her child, her um, granddaughter and her mom, she found her mom. Um, she had passed away. She found her the day after Christmas morning. Wow. And so... I didn't know that when it first happened, right? Like mm -hmm. I knew that a couple of days later, but this little girl was so withdrawn in class. And so it just got to the point where I, I realized mental health was much more important. And then my own journey through mental health, right? Yes. Like, um, I just got six years sober a couple of days oh, ago. Fuck, yeah. And um, through my own personal journey of dealing with grief and depression and postpartum depression and anxiety and all of that, and my own journey with therapists, like, my own therapist told me I would make a good therapist. <laughs> and I was That's like, awful. oh, okay. So I did. I went back to school and got a, another master's degree. I had one in education, got another one in psychology, and this is what I do now, and I love it. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, I, have, I, have, I have quite a few questions. Because okay. um, I went off into a different uh, tangent. What, yeah, so like how is it oh, coping with, yes. like... Um, it's better now that I think when I first started, I would take a lot of things home and personalize it, especially because I work in addiction, right? Mm -hmm. So when people would leave or 
relapse or whatever, I would sit and wonder like, what did I do? Like, why didn't I do this? Right. I would personalize a lot of it. And how could you help more? Absolutely. Yeah. But I think having an amazing clinical supervisor to help me process it, who's been in this career field much longer than I have, it's really helpful to be able to decompress. Right. And to be able to have my own therapy and to process things in my own therapy yeah. and learn to turn myself off pretty much when I get home. So unless there's a crisis or something, because I am available to my clients 24 seven, pretty mm -hmm. much, um, just being able to have that for myself is important. You're good. You're good. Another thing I want to ask is like, what would you say the point of therapy is? The point of therapy, like why should one go to therapy? I think therapy is to be able to explore yourself and for a therapist should be able to lead you to your own answers. A therapist should not tell you, mm. break up with him, girl. <laughs> <laughs> you may want to, <laughs> but yeah. that's not the point. The point is to take someone on their own journey mm. and for them to come to that own realization of this is what I need. This is what I need to do. Um, some therapists will dig deeper into the whys and look into things of growing up and attachment things and like why you are where you are. And then some therapists is more solution based. Okay, this is what the problem is. Let's let me help you guide you to make, you know, get to the solution of this. So it depends. Each person comes in differently and they're on their own path and their own journey. And yeah. where I may lead one client to think and to do something this way, I may not do that with the next client. You know, yeah. it depends. We are wrapped up in the things that have happened to us in our past. Yes. I feel like everything that we do today is because of something mm -hmm. from our past. And like, I think I lived my life with no regrets today. Like I've done yeah, so sure. many things and some horrible things and all of that, but it took all of that for me to be where I am. For sure. And now that's part of my testimony. And I think that's how I'm able to help people. And I work in substance abuse, so I'm able to help people in their substance abuse journey because I can come to them in the psychotherapy point of view, but also as their brother and sister in recovery. Yeah. And that is what's important to me. For sure. That Yeah, but the whole thing with, for example, like our character defects, mm -hmm. like I always want to know like where that came from and like why. Mm -hmm. And it all like I feel like most issues that we have today, like with like maybe self-esteem, it all comes from oh childhood. It's very interesting. Yes. It's like all childhood. That just gave me it's chills your, when you said that. But yes, <laughs> for sure. Inner child. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I, I say often that my character defects, like I wore like a coat of armor. Right. Like I needed those character defects for a while while I was going through my own journey and my own trauma and everything. And it kept me alive. Like right? it was like life sustaining for me to hold on to yes. them in that moment. But after learning that I don't need to do that anymore, like I forgot to take that off. Like I don't need to wear all of that anymore. Mm -hmm. Like I thought I still needed to do all of that. But then I realized it was just hurting me and I was punishing people who had no idea like where I came from and why I was doing it. Oh yeah. So for me, when I asked you why, um, like, what's the point of therapy? Mm -hmm. So I grew up with like, therapy wasn't really a thing. You don't really go mm -hmm. see a therapist. Uh, my mom never really found the point of it. It was like, there was a stigma around like therapy Absolutely. and like getting mental health help. So when I came to, th when I came to like get help for substance abuse, uh, I, I was just thrown into therapy and I didn't really understand the point of it. Mm -hmm. I, I like people when I got here it was hard for me to make my own decisions because mm -hmm. it felt like anything I would do like wasn't okay. Right. So when I got into therapy, I wanted the therapist ha to tell me how to fix my life. Yes. Like, that's what I was expecting of you. Mm -hmm. I was like, what is your purpose if you're not telling, like, Absolutely. I don't know what I need. I don't know right. what I want, mm -hmm. like whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So I didn't even know what I like. I wanted to eat. So I need you to tell me. <laughs> no, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. We spend so much of our lives, especially when we come to therapy through substance abuse, right? Because evidently we finally realize, okay, what we're doing right now isn't right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we're like, okay, tell me. And it's a balance because it's, it's to the point where you're so afraid to make the wrong decision. You just want somebody to tell you what to do, mm -hmm. right? Like you're like, this, my thinking has gotten me this far. I don't want to think anymore. Just tell me what to do. Yeah, exactly. And you go to your therapist and you want your therapist just to say, just do this. But no, because yeah. I think we take more ownership when we can come to those decisions on our own. It's more powerful. It is more powerful. And a lot of times we finagle it in a way where 
you know, we guide you to what's going to be the best decision for you. But <laughs> you have to come to that realization that that's the best decision. Yeah. Right? Especially if we live with parents who told us what to do all the time. Mm -hmm. Right? And then our therapist just becomes like this other person who's just telling us what to do. And mm -hmm. that's not okay. Right? Because then mm -hmm. we're doing it more for them to please them versus what's good for us. For sure. And a lot of people have a lot of those people pleasing qualities and they just want people to be okay with them. Yeah. And I've, I've, I've confronted some clients in session sometimes of, you know, I feel like you're not being honest with me. Do you think I'm going to judge you? Mm -hmm. You know, and they think I'm going to be mad at them for maybe going back to this boyfriend that, <laughs> that they've already decided not to see anymore, <laughs> things like that, you know, but um, even to touch on something else you said, just going to therapy and what that looked like growing up. Mm -hmm. Did you get to go to therapy Absolutely growing up? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. I was not like, it was not okay for me to be sad, mad, angry, anything like that. None of my emotions were okay unless I was happy. Because if I were happy, my mom felt like she was being a good mom. If I were sad, then she felt like she wasn't, right? And so I think I was trained to always make it seem like I was okay. And I was just talking to my younger sister um, just last night and we talked about you know, I, my mom sent me a picture actually um, in text the other day. And I looked at this picture of myself at 13 years old and I looked at my eyes and in my eyes, I was so depressed. And I was like, I can see that now. I mm -hmm. couldn't see it then, but I couldn't talk about it. You know, I couldn't talk. I didn't know what depression was. Yeah, me neither. I don't yeah. know how to identify depression. Yeah, but yet at 15 years old, I'm taking... 28, 28, not 30. It was a bottle of 30, but I took 28 sleeping pills because I was so numb and depressed. I just wanted to kill myself, mm. right? And it's so difficult because I felt that way. I had no one to talk to. And I think the worst part of it was after that happened and I was rushed to the hospital and stayed in the emergency room overnight and drinking charcoal and had my stomach pumped, no one talked to me about it afterwards. Wow, it was unspoken. It was unspoken. So have you ever, like, did you ever try to talk to somebody about the way you felt as a kid? After you... that happened, no one talked about it. I think I tried to reach out to some teachers in high school. This was a time that I was in high school. Um, I remember going to a counselor and the counselor contacted my mom and my mom was upset. You know, it wasn't, you? it wasn't, yes, at me for maybe like letting these, these people People know that you're not feeling <laughs> no, okay. something. And so then I just knew to shut it down. And so I was never, I had no other suicide attempts, but I maybe still had suicidal ideation. And then when I went to college, things changed. Um, my depression looked a lot differently in college. What did it, how did it change? It looked like alcoholism. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's when the drinking took off. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was like, oh, I can just drink. And if I drink, I feel better. And so that was the solution for a while, mm -hmm. for a long while. Yeah. I was asking if you ever like attempted to talk about it, right? Because I, I, I was depressed and anxious and I didn't always feel okay or mm -hmm. the best. Like I always wanted to leave school because I was so scared of these social interactions mm -hmm. and like people and I was sad and I would just, mm -hmm. I wanted to leave school early to go home and fucking cry mm -hmm. myself to sleep. And... I just felt as if I couldn't tell right. anybody. Mm -hmm. I, I don't even think I ever attempted because mm -hmm. I, I think I had a stigma with mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. around like talking about it and not being okay all the time. Like there's right. something wrong with not being okay all the time. Mm -hmm. So yeah, same. I didn't talk about it. My mom never knew how I was feeling beforehand. She was completely shocked when the ambulance pulled up. Yeah. I can't remember too much that happened after that, but it was never talked about it. So when she didn't bring it to me, I think I felt like, okay, I'm not worth it. I think that was the first stamp on me, like, I'm not worthy, right? If I'm, if you're not going to talk about something this drastic that happened, then I'm mm -hmm. not worthy, you know? And, and to put the, the cherry on top, I remember a couple days after that happened, I got released from the hospital. My mom actually like went out of town with her boyfriend that weekend and sent us to her friend's house. Wow. So that really just made me feel like, okay, well, if I don't matter to my mom, who do I matter to, you know? And so actually... In the, in the time between before I went to college and found the solution of alcohol, <laughs> um, boys became my answer because then I felt worthy to boys if I were to be sexually active with them. So I became sexually active at an extremely young age of 15 and 
that was my whole phase. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like in, in high school, because I just needed to feel worthy. And I didn't grow up with my dad. I haven't said that. My dad was, I guess my mom left him at three when I was three years old. Didn't have a relationship with him. So I felt like, okay, if these boys are making me feel good about myself, then I'll just continue to sleep with him and maybe him and then maybe him. And so that became a solution for me for a long time too. How did, when did you start getting to that point of like working through, like, was it when you got sober that you started working through everything or like, oh, like yes. taking a look at your mental health? <laughs> um, yes. And when I, I think that's when I became more consistent with it. Um, when I went to treatment, mm -hmm. I think it was the first time that I had told a therapist about some of the sexual trauma that I dealt with. Hmm. And I actually came to a real, I always thought it was just this one person who sexually abused me. And then in therapy and treatment, I had this realization that another person had done it. Mm. And it was even more confusing or hurtful because this was somebody that I considered one of my favorite relatives. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. It was an aunt. And it, was, it, it put the eyes of it differently because always it was always this male who did it for over these period of years. But then in, in treatment, I realized, oh my gosh, that wasn't the first time I was sexually abused. I was actually sexually abused years before by this person that I have loved and hung out with and all of that since then. Mm -hmm. And so it was through that and then the therapy that I continued with after leaving treatment that helped me start the healing process yeah and you know working the 12 steps because i think when i did my love and sex column in my fourth step i was yeah. able to see a lot of the the patterns of what i was searching for mm -hmm. when it came to you know sex and relationships yeah it's insane how much clarity we get after mm -hmm. once we get sober mm -hmm. buried memories mm -hmm. of like and it was all like trauma was the buried yeah. memories absolutely they just, we just come push up. it down yeah, and it's really crazy that I could like push it down, like yeah. really from my memory. Mm -hmm. um, and I hated, I hated remembering things. Mm -hmm. That's why I love Xanax and alcohol. Yeah. I love blacking out. Mm -hmm. um, and then when people start to remind you about it the next day or anything like that, the best thing to do, what we thought the best thing was to do was, well, I'll just, just drink and use again. Yes, of course. So I can I forget this conversation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you just get in that cycle, mm -hmm. right? And it took for me to just pull myself out of that cycle and to realize that there was a solution, right? And to be able to work, you know, the 12 steps as well as to go to therapy, like that was unheard of. It's still unheard of, you know? And you were mentioning just about being a black woman in therapy. Like I, I know for, at least for my own culture of being a black woman, it, I don't really know a whole bunch of people who go to therapy. Like now it's becoming a thing and my friends are going to therapy, but for so long, no. And we are so rare in our profession. It's rare to find a black therapist yeah. in our profession. And a lot of people, that's a need, not for everybody, but for a lot of black people, that's a need to have somebody that is culturally, not just culturally aware, but that can be empathetic with what's going on in the world when it comes to being a minority. Yes. Mm -hmm. I had a, so I had issues with like men and trust mm. when coming here. Uh, so yeah, my first therapist was a woman, but I only had her for X amount of time. Mm -hmm. And then I was, I got a male therapist mm -hmm. and I was like, dude, <laughs> this white guy really, right? like I, I, <laughs> and it could work. Felt, Did it work for you? It, it worked. The next white guy worked. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We're still talking about therapy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, you're still talking right. about therapy. And it's so funny because I always tell people in treatment, it's a little different because you are with who they assign you to, mm -hmm. right? You really don't have that much of a choice, but when you're just out in the world, if you sit with a therapist and you don't click, don't give up on therapy, like date around with your therapist, go to some different therapists until you find who you click with. And like one of my favorite therapists is a white man, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that worked for me. I don't even think I've ever had a black therapist now that I think about it. Look at that. Yeah. You know, and some people but, need it and some people don't. I'm more of an open book. Like I can, I can get out there and try it out. And if it works, I, I just need someone, I think at this point, I just needed to be heard. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think therapy was just so brand new to me. I just needed somebody to listen to me. And yeah. the most work I did was with a woman um, who understood the steps, but in a different way, she was in a different program. And I felt like she listened and understood. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I had a negative like view on mm -hmm. speaking to a 
a white male, mm-hmm. almost like a, a stigma yeah. against like a white male therapist. I was like, this guy is not going to get me. Right. First of all, I don't trust you because you're a man. Mm-hmm. And um, it, it felt like I almost couldn't get be vulnerable at first. Right. But like I cried the first session. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah, and then we ended up connecting and clicking. Mm-hmm. I did a lot of work, plenty of breakthroughs, mm-hmm. and um, but yeah, it's uh, therapy is a trip. You kind of do have to do some some shopping and just being honest. I feel like if I feel like everybody needs that at least like one person they can be completely honest mm-hmm. with. At least one, and ideally, I feel like it should be a therapist. Yes. Yeah. Um, and it helps some people, that you'll like, be amazed of how many people come into therapy still lying. Yeah, and that's why and sometimes it, it just takes a while, right? Yeah. Because you don't trust that therapist at first. You're not sure. You don't want to put everything out there. Yeah. You and know? It's, it's funny because it's like li- literally legally confidential. Mm-hmm. And, so don't and a lot of people don't get it, mm-hmm. right? They don't get it. So unless you're going to tell me that you have abused a child or, you know, about to kill yourself or about to kill someone else, like everything else is confidential. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like... And let's okay so tell me you know yeah, yeah, yeah. And it takes a while and i've i've realized that as a therapist that i've had some clients that come in at first and i can tell they're super reserved and i kind of come with you know my the stigma of them sometimes you know what, what mean? i mean um just working with maybe ex-cons you know what i mean and so I was scared at first. Like, what am I going to be able to do to be able to guide this person and help this person? They're going to look at me and say, you know nothing about the life of being in prison. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I've done so much work with them and have like seen transformations and have built really good relationships. So now I'm like, yeah, bring me all the cons. Bring me all the ex-cons. Because I, it's just a, a, a um, population that I was fearful that I was going to be able to be impactful. But I think mm. when there's openness and honesty... When it, from the client, but also as a therapist of feeling free to say, you know what, I'm not too sure what that looks like. Can you tell me more about this experience, you yeah. know, when it comes to that? So it's, it's interesting. Like I learned something every day, yeah. you know, and I'm, I, I remain open to learning things, you know, and learning more about the world is important and try to not carry so many, you know, um, stigmas, like we say, yeah. you know, because a lot comes with therapy and, have you had clients who like stigmatize therapy even though they're in therapy? Oh my, well, yes, <laughs> for sure. You know, especially because this is part of the program of being in treatment because I work in treatment. Mm-hmm. They have to come to therapy in order to be able to remain in treatment. And sometimes we'll have sessions and people will just deflect, deflect and talk about a bunch of, you know, surface things and get scared when it's top, time to talk about something in depth, mm-hmm. especially when it comes to trauma. What are the overall benefits of going to therapy? Um, I think... Why should one person go to therapy? Sometimes I, I feel like we get to a point where we judge ourselves in our own head, right? We kind of do the things we think we should do, for, that we were kind of shaped and led to believe we should do and should think and all of that. Um, and so I think going to therapy, you learn yourself on a deeper level. Mm -hmm. right like you do a lot of self-reflection and homework you may have some homework assignments it can definitely help your relationships um but definitely your relationship with yourself and sometimes you have to go to therapy to get to forgive yourself you know I think when I you know especially when I was processing my trauma I carried a lot of guilt for some of the trauma from either not telling anybody or you know when you talk about sexual trauma a lot of people don't understand that just because your body responded in a way that maybe felt good, you feel guilty for that. And then you're like, "Is am I really at fault? Like, oh my mm. God, it felt good to me. So maybe I'm wrong too. And I think that's a big part that's not talked about. Like your body's going to respond in a way, even though this is wrong. Yeah. Cause it's, we're he- like, we're human. It's like, it's part of instinct. Absolutely. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it doesn't matter. And so I think it takes a lot. Anybody who's gone through trauma, if you're experiencing certain symptoms, you know, if it's nightmares, intrusive memories, hypervigilance, um, stutter with like, it's like so many symptoms, right? We have this big book. It's like a Bible. It's called the DSM-5. <laughs> and it's like a checklist. Like that's how you get your official diagnosis. That book? Right. But sometimes we can just have some of the traits and you can't have an official diagnosis, but we can have a lot of the symptoms of Thing. What are the benefits of diagnosing somebody with something? Because I know a lot of people, they don't... Like the label? They don't like the label. They're like, mm-hmm. dude, I was just diagnosed with like bipolar, for right. example. And they're like, fuck that. It's it's a way that 
it, so common language can be used when it comes to treatment, right? So if you have this label, when someone sees it on paper, you go to another therapist or whatever else, it, it pretty much lets people know, like, these are the symptoms that I have and these are the ways to treat it. So the label just makes the, the language universal. And so the fact that we're talking about stigmas, there are certain diagnoses that come with stigma. Oh, for sure. Right? Like bipolar, uh, borderline personality, schizophrenia, for sure. Uh, but it just gives us a way of list, like knowing, okay, if this, if this is the label, then these are the symptoms I'm probably expressing. It's just a way to, so now we know how to treat it. These mm. are the things that are happening. This is how to treat it. It's just like any other medical condition, yeah. right? Like if I have diabetes and you know, if I have diabetes, that means my sugar is this. And then I need to treat it with insulin or I need to treat it with diet. It's the same as any other diagnosis in the medical world. Hmm. So we can have a, a plan of treatment. Hmm. And being diagnosed with something, uh, does it always mean that you're going to be prescribed medication? Definitely not. Definitely not? Definitely not. Um, and this is going to go back to my teaching days. Like a lot of parents did not want their children diagnosed with ADHD mm. because they automatically thought, oh, they're, they're going to put my, my kid on meds. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. going to give them Adderall. They're going to give them Ritalin or whatever. And I get it. There are other ways to treat certain things. And it also depends on the severity of something. Mm -hmm. Right. There are certain diagnoses that more than likely is going to need medication, like something like schizophrenia, you know, undiagnosed yes. or unmedicated schizophrenia or even unmedicated bipolar. You're probably going to encounter a lot more problems than maybe some anxiety that's not medicated. Yeah. Right. Because it depends. But it depends on how severe the symptoms are. If your anxiety gets to the point where you can't go outside because you're so afraid of something or things like that or you have panic disorder then you might benefit with meds, but the best way to treat usually is medication as well as therapy. You don't just want to go to therapy. You don't just want to pop some pills. Like you want to at least combine the two at first to get the best chance of some type of um, relief and some type of improvement of your symptoms, decrease of symptoms. And then maybe you can just go with therapy later or just medication later. But Medication should always be prescribed by a medical doctor or psychiatrist. I want to emphasize that a therapist has no say so on what medications yeah. you're on. We can help you monitor it and your symptoms and refer you back to your doctor. Mm. But as a therapist, your job is just to do the psychotherapy part. The psychotherapy. They, mm -hmm. But you do you diagnose? You I, I can do diagnosis, yes, but I can't prescribe. You can't prescribe med medication. No, no. Yeah. Not unless I were a psychiatrist. Yes. And that's a whole, that's a lot more school. That's a whole different thing. Yeah, with some more student loans that I'm not ready to do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have, a, I have a, like a thing about like, almost like a, like a stigma, like a negative like mm -hmm. attitude towards going back to school. Why? Um, I just think it's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> to get a I piece of paper, it's... put all that work in, get yeah, a piece of paper. like... I first I struggled with school as it like as is. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's also like public high school, like okay. you know, like fuck that. Yeah, it's just not an overall good experience. Right. I don't know who had a good experience in high school. I would love mm -hmm. to have a conversation with you. Yeah, I did it. But <laughs> <laughs> um, I almost think it's like giving into like the government and society mm -hmm. and like playing, being um, what's the word I'm looking for? like a robot mm. like i just feel like it's just i'm gonna be in debt mm -hmm. and then i probably won't do the job that i got a degree for or something because mm -hmm. that's what happens very often mm -hmm. um and i just don't think i'll do good at it as well i just oh, don't like that's just negative self -talk. yeah trying to get some free therapy out of me right now <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. And, uh, there's also like something like things in school, <laughs> things in school. Like I don't know, I w I wouldn't know what to pick. And right. My parents have been like pressing me a little mm -hmm. bit. <laughs> no, this feels like a. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can get that on my head. <laughs> but you know, you have to determine what you want to do. Mm -hmm. If you don't know what you want to do, then it's no good to go back to school yet. There are like certain types of therapists or life coaches too, but therapists that can give you certain um, assessments based on your personality that can lead you to different type of career choices wow. to consider. So maybe that's something you do. Wow. Don't just go back to school unless you know what you want to do. Yeah, I feel like my parents are pressing me yeah. about it. I'm like, dude, I never intended on ever mm -hmm. going back to school. Mm -hmm. I got my high school diploma. <laughs> <laughs> 
Whereas me, I looked at education as like a sense of self-worth. Really? Yes, because I was the first in my family to go to college. You know, out of all my grandmother's kids, out of all the grandkids, I was the first to get a, a college degree. Mm. And then and that's also like a big deal, mm -hmm. like with a lot of people who come from other countries mm -hmm. or just like in like from poverty, like they push that onto their kid. Absolutely. To go to school. Mm -hmm. Not That's like a good goal for like a kid. Like you want your child to do good and get an education, get a wonderful right. job, but it puts pressure. Yeah, it does. And. I guess for me, it wasn't like, I think my mom would have been okay with my graduated high school because no one had gone to college. If I had just gone to high school and got a job after that would have been fine. Like my, because my mom didn't go to um, college, I was kind of left on my own to navigate all of that. Like, how do I apply for financial aid? Mm -hmm. How do I apply to college? Mm -hmm. How do I do that? So the fact and that I that made stuff. it to college was huge you know and not only did i just get a yeah. BA, then i went back and got a teaching credential honestly, and then yeah. a master's degree and honestly like, congrats like good dang. shit like yeah. you know some stuff <laughs> i mean but it was because of like i i, I realized i needed that to succeed you know at least from my experience i knew that i needed to do something different if i wanted to get somewhere differently in life mm -hmm. you know and looking at a lot of my relatives and the life that they i don't want to say chose from themselves but they fell into um, it comes with a lot of <laughs> jail records, prison records, arrest, you know, things like that. And I needed something different for myself. Yeah. Hmm. School, dude. I don't know. <laughs> I, um, yeah, cause most of the, I'm 19 mm -hmm. and then right when I like graduated high school, I came to treatment. Mm. So like my college is treatment. Mm -hmm. Like I'm learning life Yeah. and people my age that I knew back home mm -hmm. are like, in college, like right. in education. I think they're like, what, sophomore year of like college now? I would bet you probably have more life experience <laughs> coming out here to go to treatment versus yeah. a freshman year in college anywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, most people just kind of go crazy that freshman year, being away from parents and parties and drinking. And I went to school at San Diego, so I was like 30 minutes from the border to Mexico. So we would drive to Mexico. The legal drinking age was 18. I was oh. like, yes, I arrived, you know? and. Yeah, that was an experience. <laughs> Dude, I want to go to Mexico. Is there anything else you want to say, like, on mental health? Um, what it's been like, the struggles you faced and how you overcame them being, like, a black woman in recovery? Um, I think the other thing that I just wanted to touch on was just, like, the generational trauma type things. You know, I look back on the things that I endured and how my mother was unable to be there for me in certain things. And for a long time, I faulted her on that. Right. Like, I can't believe she didn't do this. But then I had to look at, well, how was she raised mm -hmm. and what kind of mother was my grandmother? You know what I mean? And then and even so far, you know, it would be back even further. Yeah, for sure. My grandmother was, you know, born and raised in the South, you know, mm -hmm. in Georgia, you know, Jim Crow and all of that. And I can't even start to imagine the things that she endured and saw like in the deep South. And so anyway, it's it's just breaking that cycle. Right, but not just a cycle of abuse, but the cycle of don't ask, don't tell, let's sweep it under the rug and not talk about it. And I think so many things happened to my mom that she was unable to talk about with her mother. And then so when things came up in our family and for me, my mom was unable to be there for me emotionally because she just didn't know how, mm -hmm. right? And so I can't continue to expect her to do that if she just, doesn't have the emotional capability to do that. Yeah. And so just breaking the cycle. Cause now, you know, I have three biological children, two step kids. My oldest is 26. My youngest are 10. I have twins that are 10. Allowing them to feel their feelings. Yeah. Like allowing them to feel their feelings and to talk about their feelings and to make it okay. Um, and my oldest that's had therapists is in therapy. Um, and my girls know what I do. They know, well, in their own words, like, you help sad people, you help people to feel better. Um, and so they know that they can talk about their feelings, you know, like really they good. know that I'm a therapist and we can talk about your feelings. You can be mad, you can be angry, you can feel all of that. Like how you respond to that, we have to talk about, <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. you can't be breaking things or whatever. Let's, let's handle your anger in this way. Let's handle your sadness here, but just to know that they can talk about it mm -hmm. because I really want to continue to break the stigma when it comes to mental health talking about it because a lot of times people see it as a weakness and nobody wants to be weak 
Mm -hmm. Right. But for people to understand that if I talk about it and get over it, it takes more strength to do that for sure than to keep it all pushed down and not talk about it because hurt people hurt people. Right. Then you end up hurt. Then you go out and hurt other people. And then all of that just continues. But if I can heal myself, I can heal not just my children, but everybody that I work with, you know, whether it's my clients or my sponsees or whatever else. And that's what I thrive in. I thrive in showing people there's a different way. So I guess that goes back to answer your first question, like why become a therapist? I needed to show people there's a different way. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to be sad or depressed or just feel out of sorts. You know, grief was a big one for me. I lost my brother seven years ago. That really pushed my alcoholism over the edge and um, have helping people understand there's a, a different way that they can grieve and they won't always feel the way they feel in that moment. It's important. That's beautiful. Yeah. Um, it, it does take a lot more strength to actually allow yourself to feel your feelings. Mm-hmm. And like the only way out of them is like through them. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, like I embrace the, the sadness sometimes. Like I'm, right. I'm going to feel this because I yeah. know it's going to like, like, you can't have like the happy without the sad. Absolutely. And the sad without the happy. Absolutely. You wouldn't and like embrace like the happy. Can you imagine much. just being happy every single day. Yeah, exactly. It's like, mm, this is all. Then it just becomes like the norm. Yeah. Right. And then it's like, okay. I think about that like on a roller coaster. Like a roller coaster is fun. But if you just stay on that roller coaster all day, like, yeah, it's like, when like, is it over? This is too much, you know? And so we have to embrace those times and, and to learn from them. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, I appreciated life so much differently after I lost my brother. You know, and I had to go through that grief in order to appreciate my life more and to be able to help people who may be dealing with some of the same things he was dealing with. Like, that's another reason why I became a therapist, you know, is to be able to help people who dealt with a lot of some of the traumas that I knew he dealt with, as well as navigating the world as a a black gay man, you Mm -hmm. know, was a lot of part of his mental health. And so that's my, if I didn't work in substance abuse, I would definitely work in the LGBT community because- that's like near and dear to my heart. Cause that's where a lot of the trauma, a lot of the depression, a lot of that is. Yeah. Too, some, yeah. Some people grow up in like the, their families don't take it well. Oh my God. And the community that they're that's in, saying it depending nicely. on the area, mm-hmm. depending on the area that you're in, they won't take it. Like the community won't take yeah. it well. People have gotten kicked out, like removed from their families, just like cut off completely, mm-hmm. you know, especially if it were like, you know, combined with like religious trauma. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's a whole nother I'm not going to name any religions right now, but like, I think that was a thing too, you know, him being a black gay man and growing up in like a super religious family, um, like on his grandparents end, like he just felt lost, yeah. you know, we did a geographical and things got worse and no. now he's not here. I'm sorry to hear that. Oh, thank you. Um, generational trauma is real. Mm -hmm. Uh, Everything in my household growing up was also swept under the rug. Mm. If it came to like abuse or just like, like feelings, it's just like, oh, Mm -hmm. sorry about it. I don't know. Like we just didn't talk about it whatsoever. So I, that's, I pushed that down with drugs. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for kind of coming on here, bringing awareness to like mental health and therapy, the benefits of it and like sharing a little bit of your story. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, thank you. Well, thank you for having me. Of course.